All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we made it. We came to the last week before the fall break. Just a little bit more. I know you're all tired and probably stressed, but we are almost uh, there. So I will start by wrapping up some of the pre-training fine-tuning stuff we have talked about uh, last time. I hope you enjoyed the lecture by Kyle. I find it personally informative. Um, and after we are done with that, we are going to go and just talk about the stuff we have basically talked about so far in this course as a way to prepare for the midterm. However, I want to emphasize that whatever we talk about today is not, um, it doesn't serve as a, as a replacement for all the slides, all the recorders, all the lectures we had uh, so far. So you might find in exam something we talked about before in the class that wasn't repeated again today. So be cautious about relying just on today's conversation as a way to prepare for your midterm. Ideally, you would just ask me a ton of questions as we go. I did put some slides from the slides I had before uh, for the class, um, but ideally you would ask me questions and we would you know, clarify any kind of confusions that there are right now. So use it then as an opportunity for you uh, to kind of clear all the doubts you have so far. Okay, so let's just go back to pre-training fine-tuning before we dive into the uh, uh, review. And one thing I wanted to emphasize, which I felt maybe I didn't emphasize when I talked about pre-training, um, is, um, okay, we start with the transformer architecture. We are randomly initializing it, and then we are using some corpus of unlabeled data and use either mask language modeling or language modeling objective to uh, change the weights of this model, and then we get a model that we can later use for many purposes by continued training, which we call fine tuning. Since we have learned everything in this course in you know a couple of months, maybe some things are now kind of starting to overlap in your head. And one thing that might be unclear is how word embeddings come into play. How those glove or work uh, to work embeddings that you have used for deep averaging network in your second assignment are, um, you know, how do we use them here? And the direct answer is that we do not use them uh, in the same way you have been using them in a deep averaging network by downloading them and then having them be our first um, layer in a transformer architecture. Instead, developers of language models, of large language models, when they start pre-training model from scratch, they decide, okay, we are going to use this uh, tokenization. So maybe they chose then, uh, for example, OpenAI and GPT family of models does use BPE tokenizer that you know. Uh, but someone else might be using different algorithm. One thing that's shared among all of the current large language models is that they are gonna use subword tokenization, not word tokenization. So in any case, they choose a tokenizer and then that defines what their vocabulary is and what their tokens are. And then we know that the next step for embedding is, is to have an embedding for each token in our vocabulary which are now whatever those developers have obtained with through their tokenization. And again, subword tokenization is driven by data. So you can't know a priori what kind of tokens they got. You really need to inspect them in, uh, in their vocabulary. Okay, so as always, they, we have a vocabulary stemming from our tokenizer. We have an embedding matrix of the size number of tokens in the vocabulary times the dimensionality of the first embeddings. And when people pre-train transformer, they will randomly initialize this big matrix first, and they will change its weights through the pre-training procedure. So they will consider this embedding matrix to be part of the weights. So after pre-training is done, now the embeddings for your tokens are those embeddings that you have found in that embedding matrix after pre-training. They're no longer glove or word to vec or any other embeddings you might have heard of. Embeddings you get, the first embeddings are going to be those that are in the first layer of your pre-trained transformer, okay? So you're not now replacing those with anything else because then you will break the computations that the next weight matrix expects to get when it's a do linear transformation because it was looking at certain vectors during pre-training. And if you would now replace it with something else, you would bre break this computation. Okay, so when you download the pre-trained language model, 
you're not going to go and seek any other embeddings. You have it as a part of your transformer architecture, OK? Um, and I also want to make it clear that when we are replacing our tokens by token embeddings in the first layer, those token embeddings are static, meaning that they are always the same regardless of the sense of the word, right, or that token. And we have re learned about uh, words that have multiple senses. Only the upcoming transformation, specifically self-attention in the transformer, will make these representations of tokens contextualized, meaning that their these token embeddings will now uh, reflect information, the context in which these tokens appear. So words that the same token that has two different senses in different contexts eventually will have a different contextualized embedding that comes from the last layer of the transformer. Okay, so I wanted to make that clear. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so I still kind of pitch the pre-training all the time, but telling you we will come at a better space or part of our optimization landscape. And more concretely, what that means is that by training the model to predict the next or mask word, the model needs to learn a lot of useful language features. And those features are transferable for many NLP tasks. So once the pre-training is done, people have inspected what is happening, what is captured in these embeddings that represent these tokens and full texts. And they found that actually, and we won't, I won't tell you how exactly, but just have in mind that there is methodology to realize that actually uh, useful linguistic features are captured in these representations that come from pre-training. And that means, okay, now you are in a bad, better space or continued training for your downstream NLP task because your representation of tokens already capture a lot of nuanced linguistic information. This is why fine-tuning pre-trained language models is very effective. And this is one, uh, very nice paper on this topic. We will talk uh, in the last few weeks of this course about more classic approaches to NLP tasks. And I will teach you some classic NLP uh, tasks like name identity recognition. And this is basically what this paper is saying is that the, in the representations that come from the pre-trained transformer model, you can find information about those classic tasks. So I don't wanna talk about it now since you don't know these tasks yet, but we'll come back to this at the end of the course. So we, we still have a way, a way to go to come there. All right, and the last thing, uh, second to last thing I wanna talk about is um, how do these developers like Kyle choose once they start training a model, uh, what is going to be their pre-training data size and what's going to be their the model size, right? Like if you know it, uh, anything about the recent LLMs, you will see that they often come in sizes like 8 billion parameters or 70 billion or 405 billion and so on. So how did the developers pick these numbers? So this is related to the line of work called scaling laws. Scaling laws are trying to find the dependence of language modeling loss or perplexity. We know that these things are uh, closely related. You want to see the dependence of language modeling loss uh, all with the size of your transformer, the computation power you have to train your transformer, and the uh, data available for its training process. One factor that is known to the developers is how much compute they have. Um, maybe you have noticed that Kyle was talking about we have this number of GPU hours, right? So what's typically happening is that these companies are getting these massive clusters um, they can borrow them for a certain amount of months, and they have some on-prem machines too. Um, but they don't have as many GPUs as they would ideally like to have. So every company is bounded by the number of GPUs they have, and some have more and some have uh, less. Maybe you have heard about the term GPU poor, um, which now also stands for massive amounts of uh, GPU power. Uh, so that's one factor that every company knows when they start pre-training a model, how much GPUs they have for how many months. And they can start from that. What these scaling laws then give are equations, like a closed form formulas 
which, uh, given the number of uh, computational budget you have, these um, these um, equations tells you well you should be using this much uh, uh, parameters with this much uh, data, and basically how people have created these equations is by uh, running lots of lots of these experiments by various model size, data size, budget size configurations. So they have a ton of these experiments. And then they are trying to find which kind of um, curves fit this um, dependence of the parameters to the loss or the data with the loss and so on. It's a lot of former physicists. Um, so if you have been excited for about physics at any point in your life, you might see a connection with those formulas when you see them. One thing I want you to know is, is that this is an active area of research. Uh, when GPT-3 uh, has been released, which uh, is basically GPT-3 is a large pre-trained language model uh, that had been, as you can imagine, uh, it came before GPT-4 and it was also important in the research community. Um, these authors that also come from OpenAI had uh, provided these first estimates for these equations. And two years after, they have been shown to actually be incorrect by people at Google DeepMind, uh, particularly Hoffman et al. Uh, in this paper, they have also released a model that's called Chinchilla, and then people are referring to these scaling laws as Chinchilla scaling laws, which is, I don't know, I mean, you have noticed that the naming of things in this line of work is a little bit funky, so just get used to it, you know, don't question it. Um, and basically what they have found in this, uh, uh, in this work is that Kaplan et al. had suggested that given a 10 times increase in computational budget, meaning your GPU hours, um, they suggest that the size of the model should decrease five times, while the data size should increase only roughly two times. And this paper, Kaplan et al. says it's actually not the case that you need to increase the model size two times more than the data size, actually you should be increasing them with the same uh, amount. Effectively, what this means is that you can have a smaller model and with more data, you can achieve equally powerful model to having many more times larger model. So this is why people have found out that actually if you use 8 billion or 70 billion model, you can get the performance of 175 billion model, which is a huge, huge achievement because we want to have smaller models because larger they are, harder it is to fit them on GPU memory and we need GPUs to train these things effectively. Okay. So um, right now, if you look at any kind of publication, publication uh, uh, that comes with LLMs, you will see that Hopman and Tal scaling laws are still used to this day uh, with some additional tweaks. For example, you can check Lama 3's uh, section. Okay, so I wanted to mention this. So this is a little bit more advanced. I won't ask you about scaling laws in the uh, exam. Uh, but I think it's good for you to know that these things are not just picked randomly, rather there is some procedure behind it also still kind of involving. It's This is not settled yet on how we should do this exactly. And people are trying to figure out that uh, uh, today. Uh, yeah, they're trying to figure it out still. Uh, it's, an, it's not a set, a set matter. Okay, so one last thing for pre-training I wanna show you is um, how to fine tune a model in a hugging phase. Let me do this. All right, so is this large enough for you to see? Back row, good, all right, nice. All right, so first of all, Hugging Face uh, is, a, is a company that had produced uh, many different libraries that people in NLP research and development are using. Um, so our researchers like Fatima and Purbe, they are using Hugging Face for their research things. Um, developers who are building models for specialized purposes too. So if you, you know, decide to work in NLP and later find a job after you're done with this program, you will certainly be using Hugging Face. I doubt you can avoid it. Uh, it comes with various libraries. Transformers is uh, maybe the main one uh, or the one that it started with. 
they basically started in 2018 when BERT had been released. And they were like, all right, we need an implementation of this thing. We need to be having a platform where when a new pre-trained language model is released, we already have a big chunk of code and we just need to uh, put the weights uh, and download new weights and then we can use the rest of the code we had before for fine tuning it. That's how he started. They tried to standardize this such as that the development uh, is faster and they have been so successful with it. Currently they had a massive milestone of having 1 million models uh, uh, available on the Hugging Face platform. They also have data sets. Data sets is a library for easily accessing and sharing data sets. They have Evaluate, uh, which is you know, maybe similar to scikit-learn in a sense of you can get various evaluation measurements uh, like accuracy of one score. Then we have already seen tokenizers, right? We don't need to uh, implement BPE from scratch. We can use more efficient versions, which as we know from Kyle's lecture is super important. And then there is this hugging of face hub where uh, this is now um, outdated. I should have um, updated it with they, where they have 1 million models. And I mean, that's just incredible that there are 1 million models out there. Okay, and they have uh, also NLP course. And I hear you have chapters two and three of their course is also a way to learn about these uh, important libraries. And in your last two assignments, you will be dealing with hugging face. All right, so let me just quickly show you how you can fine tune a model. First, you need to, you know, pip install transformers. Uh, I already run some of these things because um, uh, it takes a little bit of time. And uh, then the first thing to do is to load a data set. For example, um, we can use the SST2 data sets you have been using in your works. And this is quite sweet. I mean, uh, you just need to, from data sets, the library import load data set, give the data set or task name, and then you can use the load data set. You can also specify the split of the data you want. Uh, you don't really need to specify the split. You can be just loading the whole uh, data set and then um, you can be retrieving the appropriate split by just calling the uh, argument train or dev or test. So super nice, you know, I don't know. I mean, when I was doing my PhD, so much time would go into just preparing the data and making sure it's in this reasonable format because there was no expectations many people might be using it like there is now. And because there is the expectation that many people will use a data set, these things are way more standardized. All right. So here, this is just a little script to uh, write a few examples. Pretty sweet. You can get a nice little table with few examples, which is something I always suggest to do to look at what are you actually trying to predict? What is your task? And then goes the pre-processing of the data. And here, um, by pre-processing, I and mean we will just basically tokenize um, the uh, data we have. And this is an important bit kind of connected with what I, how I started today's lecture is uh, when I said that developers of a given pre-trained language model choose the tokenization and they run it on their data to get tokens and merging rules that will define the tokenization. So every pre-trained model has its different tokenizer and you need to be retrieving that tokenizer. What Hugging Face enables you is to get that information very quickly. So here you need to know the uh, the, the name of the pre-trained language model you are interested to work with. If you go to Hugging Face, uh, for example, here the Berta, you see how there is a first uh, result. You would just copy this uh, name. Um, the reason why it's important to, I would say that it's always the best to copy it because you might not know that Microsoft is the developer of the Berta and that it needs to be part of the name that you are giving to Hugging Face to actually load the model and the tokenizer. So see here the model checkpoint, I'm giving this name that you have just copied from the uh, website. Okay, and the nice thing about the Hugging Face, another nice thing is that it's just so, in, in a way, abstracts a lot of things away for you to not think about them. So they have, a class auto tokenizer. You don't need to know whether the Berta's tokenizer is of a class BPE, 
or work the piece or sentence piece or whatever else tokenizer there is in the world. You instead, you're just loading this auto tokenizer class and calling this uh, function from pre-trained, give the name of the model you are interested to work with, and everything will be handled in the backend for you. The Hugging Face library will find, given the name of the model you have uh, given, what is the tokenizer that this model is using, then go to that class and load that tokenizer for you. So regardless of which model and which tokenizer you use, you basically just need to change the name of the model. Then you can, for example, inspect what's in the vocabulary. For example, here, this is what's in the vocabulary of the Berta model. And this is a nice reminder of tokens not being necessarily full words, right? Like we have seen uh, here a lot of um, things um, and these underscores uh, probably denote that um, uh, that can that token can be um I'm I'm not sure what it means. I'm hypothesizing here, but uh it could mean that it's part of a larger, it could be part of a larger word. So you have a lot of things here. The vocabulary of the Berta is actually pretty large. It's a uh, one uh twenty-eight thousand. It's uh made more than what I would say we usually see with pre-trained language models. For example, here I have loaded bird based on case, which is the bird model. And here the uh, the vocabulary size of bird base is only 30,000. So also note this, that the vocabulary size can be widely different. And I hope now you know that this is defined by the number of merges if these both of these tokenizers have used um, BPE tokenizer. Um, yeah, so why exactly the, the Berta people have chosen to have larger vocabulary, I don't know, but they, they did that. Okay, so you can um, randomly, I have picked a sentence to tokenize, and you can see how easy it is to tokenize a sentence now. You just call the tokenizer on that sentence. Super simple, right? Like you, have, you didn't need to handle those merging rules or do any, anything like that. These are the indices of tokens uh, in, of, of tokens that this sentence is tokenized uh, into. Um, you can write a for loop to tokenize sentences, but uh, I think you will see um, in actual development of these things, it does people define the pro process function, uh, which tokenizes given examples. And then you are mapping the data set using this pre-processing function. This is the way to more efficiently tokenize the entirety of the data set rather than developing your own, writing your own for loops where you are calling tokenizer one uh, at a time. Okay, so pretty sweet. We, you know, we retrieve the tokenizer, although we have no idea what it is exactly. We have tokenized our sentences uh, into, into um, tokens given that tokenizer, and now we want to fine tune the model. Similarly, how you didn't need to really care about what the tokenizer is and how it's implemented, there is also auto model for loading the model. So here uh, you can uh, trans import auto model for sequence classification because we are doing sequence classification. Our sequence is a movie review classifying it as positive or negative. And uh, you just download the weights from the model checkpoint and the number of labels. You didn't implement the transformer. You didn't override the random weights with pre-trained weights. You just called the from pre-trained. So pretty easy. Once you have that, you need to use the training arguments to define your training arguments, uh, such as learning rate, uh, num batch size, uh, and so on. And here, um, maybe later you can check the differences, but you have a choice to either train um, in certain number of epochs, meaning going few times and epoch times over the training set, or you can choose a number of uh, steps where um, the number of steps can then amount less to going over the entire training set. So you have these um, uh, two options. And you need to also define what your evaluation measurement is for the classification. I hope you all remember that, for example, accuracy is a good choice. Um, 
you can ignore this. And then uh, the final thing you need is the trainer class, which basically is a wrapper around your gradient uh, descent. And uh, you know you kind of specify, I have this model, I wanna use uh, this uh, optimization, um, optimization uh, algorithm. Um, did we specify it somewhere here? Default is gonna be Adam. So if we didn't specify it, that will just default to Adam. I don't think we did, um, and that's it. Oh. All right, so once we have our trainer, all you need to do to train your model is called trainer.train, which is so nice, right? Like you have just defined trainer arguments, you have defined the trainer, and now calling trainer.train, the training is happening without you writing all of those four loops and everything you had, for example, in your second homework. All right, so um, what was the accuracy you were getting in your second uh, uh, assignment? 76, 70, right, okay. What number would make you really excited? Like if I show you some accuracy now, how, how high that accuracy has to be for you to be excited about the improvement over your second homework? This is obviously subjective. <laughs> so just tell something. <laughs> yep, 90, okay. Any other thoughts? 96, yeah, 98. All right, we are all shooting over 90. And the accuracy we are gonna get with this model is 95. All right, so we got 20, 20 more uh, accuracy points just by fine tuning our pre-trained transformer relative to using a uh, deep averaging network where we average word embeddings and the, we had, depending on how many layers you use in your homework, a few layers of non-linearities. Of course, many things have changed, right? We have way more powerful architecture transformer, right? Explaining transformer took me a whole hour where maybe neural networks didn't take uh, that long. Um, so that's one thing that had changed. And then the other thing that had changed is that we have now pre-trained ways instead of the random ways. But you can see how, um, you know, when I told you, I kind of wrapped my lecture before Kyle chimed in with, there were all these improvements, right? Uh, all these massive improvements from fine tuning um, pre-trained language model. And that's basically what we now have seen this difference is what happened in that time in 2017, 2018. What you have implemented in your assignment two was kind of state of the art in um, 2017. And then a massive advancements happened and this then became state of the art. Like these, these kinds of massive improvements were happening in a matter of a year. So that was the first, like 2018 was that first massive jump in this whole LLM uh, NLP uh, work. Okay, so that's that. You have this. Uh, uh, you have this um, linked. Uh, this uh, uh, this notebook. Please just make a copy of it if you are gonna play around with it yourself. Um, yeah, hugging face is gonna be an important thing to learn also for you to be prepared for com what comes um, after you are done with this you know program, both either undergrad or or grad. Okay, so this is all I want to say about pre-training and fine-tuning. I will now move into, yeah, like overview of, um, of uh, for the midterm. Are there any questions? As I say, I, I hope we just have a ton of questions um, uh, that I can address to make sure we are targeting what's, you know, um, still kind of unclear. Okay. All right, so... Seems like pre-training is clear. And before I move into um, the next stuff, I just wanna remind everyone that, um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of put all the notes about what I said at various points of times about midterm in this announcement. So if you haven't seen this, I think you should read it just to know what to expect exactly. Um, but yeah, midterm is happening this Wednesday on paper, in person only, at the usual time in this room. Uh, we will have multiple choice questions. We have covered one of these questions in quite a detail. If you have never seen that, go find the lecture where it's explained. Um, 
everything that's going to be exam will be about only what I talked about here in the lectures. So nothing about maybe in the readings uh, that, you know, that go beyond what, what I was talking about. Uh, going over the slides, recordings is a good way to prepare. Uh, there will be a single free form question where I will ask you to uh, specify components of some neural network. For example, I might ask you now linearly transform something uh, or, or something along those lines. Uh, you are allowed one regular size sheet uh, back, front and back, any font size digitally or manually produce, I don't care. You need to bring your uh, ID um, and also you need to sign your notes and submit them together with your exam. And yeah, during the exam, um, please be cautious about asking us whether your solution looks right. We want to answer those questions. Um, sometimes these questions are along the lines, am I reading this right? And this is to me also giving away an answer. You should be understanding what this sentence instruction is asking you uh, about. Sometimes there might be legit clarifications. So feel free to raise a hand and ask for clarification, but also be prepared that we might tell you, yes, you should be understanding what's written here. There, there isn't um, misconception there. Okay. So, all right. The first uh, part, I've kind of broken this into two parts. Um, not chronologically, but rather recap of all the modeling stuff we had, and then recap of different NLP tasks uh, we have uh, had uh, mentioned uh, in this course. Um, and I, I guess my reasoning behind this was, okay, we covered a lot of, of what could be just think as pure machine learning here, and we are just applying it to language. And that's what's gonna be more in this recap of the modeling part. And then recap of the NLP tasks will kind of be more about, okay, these are the NLP tasks we mentioned, this is what they are, this is how we evaluate them. Um, I don't know whether we'll cover everything, depends on how many questions they're asked and the tempo I'm thinking, whatever. In my head, we are just gonna use the rest 45 minutes to do this, but you still have all the slides and recordings from uh, before. Okay. So uh, the first model we have introduced is the logistic regression that you have implemented in the first assignment. Remember, all we have done there is apply the sigma function to the dot product between the weights vector and our feature um, uh, representation. Uh, initially, we started with bag of engrams where we got the feature vector representing the entire given sequence like a movie review. And this uh, feature vector was of the size of the number of tokens in the uh, vocabulary or the number of engrams uh, in the vocabulary. And then we recorded whether this is present or not, or whether what is the count or what is the TF-IDF value for that token. Um, later, we have also introduced average token embedding. So where we took a word embeddings of every word appearing in a movie review, and then we averaged them. Um, just because we have introduced that later with deep averaging neural network, it doesn't mean you can't use it with logistic regression, right? Uh, here, it's only important that we get the vector and that this weight vector lives in the same space such that you can do the dot product. Okay, and um, yes, when the dot product, uh, which is kind of um, saying that the weight vector is directing at the uh, direction of a positive class, uh, when it's high, uh, then you want to have a high probability of an instance being positive, which we achieve with the sigmoid, and otherwise we want a low probability. And our decision of whether something will be positive or not is based on whether the probability is larger than half or not in a binary classification case. Okay, feel free to raise a hand, interrupt me, whatever feels right. Uh, otherwise, I will just move on, okay? Uh, our next uh, approach was to do deep averaging neural network where instead of immediately started with the feature sequence, uh, we had to first average the word embeddings uh, of an each word in the, um, in the sentence. And then we got one vector from averaging. Remember averaging is done on element. Uh, it's, it's done by 
taking a sum of each uh, dimension in these vectors and then dividing them by the number of vectors. And then we had a one or more layers of nonlinearity, which means we linearly transform the initial representation. And uh, then we apply some nonlinearity here denoted by F, which can be ReLU, 10H, Sigmoid, um, whatever you like, but these days very often ReLU or some version of ReLU. And later we have softmax, which include linear transformation in the number of classes we have with binary classification, that means two. And then we apply softmax, which we given a vector, which returns the vector of the same size, except that now these unnormalized values are normalized to be between zero and one. And the sum of the numbers in softmax vectors amount to one. So this has some notion of probability distribution. Yes. Uh, so we are doing it, we actually use a tokenizer, which should be a tokenizer that splits uh, the sentence into individual uh, words that appear. But if there are two words, two same words, for example, uh, Predator is a masterpiece and it is the best movie ever, words is is going to appear twice and you will still um have two embeddings exactly the same that will contribute to this averaging. Yeah, so you're not removing duplicates of tokens or words uh, in a given sentence. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, think about it in this way. Um, while you know, some words are unwanted when there are there are too many of them, like stop words. Then you could be doing stop word removal as a part of your pre-processing. However, for some other words, if they re reappear in text, it's actually good to know that. For example, if you have few occurrences of word good or great or amazing, that's highly indicative that the call sequence will be positive. Similarly to why we have record, recorded a count in a bag of engram representation instead of just presence or absence, right? The count can also tell you a little bit more information. But yeah, you are right. If you have made too many stop words, it might be, um, yeah, you might be cramming too much information about them. Okay, so this one was pretty pretty simple, right? And then, um, yeah, before I move into the other ones we have introduced, I just want to remind what token embeddings are. Um, and we kind of started token embeddings by my, me telling you of various aspects of meanings of words that we care about, like whether words are synonyms, whether they are having more than one sense, whether they are related, similar, antonyms, and so on. And I mean, this whole lecture, we talked about how these uh, bag of engrams are not sufficient in capturing all of those aspects of uh, lexical semantics. Then I have introduced a very, very important concept of distributional hypothesis, which says that words that appear in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. And this distributional hypothesis was operationalized to learn word uh, embeddings or word vectors um, from the given corpus of text. Um, and embeddings is just another way of saying vector representation, uh, which comes from the uh, more mathematical literature. Particular algorithm we use for word to vec uh, was, uh, excuse me, particular algorithm for learning embeddings uh, we have covered is uh, word to vec specifically it's hip ground version. Uh, where the idea was that we build a classifier that predicts whether two pairs of words appear in the context or do not appear in the context. And this classifier works by taking current embeddings of those two uh, words, making a pair, getting their dot product and checking whether the dot product is high. If it's high, then they sh we should the, the model would say, yes, they, they appear together. And if their dot product is small, or another word, if their distance is large, um, then we would say under this model that they are not belonging in the context. I think one thing that confused you all when I taught this for the first time is that I didn't emphasize enough that we don't actually care about this classifier. 
want, all we care about is to get embeddings from this classifier. We start with these randomly initialized embeddings and dot products that we care about are gonna be terrible initially because we have terrible random embeddings. But by maximizing the dot product, meaning the similarity of the words that do appear in the uh, similar context, and by maximizing the distance or dissimilarity of words that do not appear in the uh, same context, we are going to get better embeddings. And later we are just gonna use those embeddings and store them in a file. I think now that you have implemented your second assignment, this might be clearer because you first downloaded those embeddings, right? And then you wrote the other layers of your neural network, which is your classifier you actually are developing for the task. So don't be confused by the fact that there is a classifier here and then you get embeddings and then you use these embeddings later on for another classification. These are two different classification tasks and we do not actually care about this one beyond learning the proper embeddings. Okay, I, I hope that's a little bit clearer now because I got a sense that didn't land the first time. And uh, a few things that were important was to recognize the difference between the bag of hangrams and the word average embeddings as a way to represent a given sequence. Um, so we said, okay, the bag of hangrams are really long of the size of um, number of tokens in the vocabulary. Now that I have just shown you uh, what are the typical sizes? Can you repeat them back to me? Like what kind of sizes of vocabulary did we see? We saw two numbers. How many? Okay, we had 30,000 uh, and 128,000 uh, in the with the bird time bird. So if that's the size of our vocabulary, that means that each sequence in, with a bag of engrams may be represented with uh, dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, dimensional vectors, which are really, really massive, right? Instead, these average embeddings will give us, as you know from your assignment, two vectors of size 50 or, um, you know, 300, which is way, way smaller. Um, the downside is that the, unlike with the back of engrams where features were interpretable, you knew that uh -huh, this number represents the count of these specific tokens, uh, token in this given sequence. With average embeddings, you have no idea what your dimensions mean anymore. You, you are completely clueless. Um, on the other hand, the nice thing about average embeddings is that there are no zeros. You're not wasting the computation. And this is important for trainability of neural networks, which do not like sparse vectors. Um, and um, we have the whole reason was to better model synonyms, similar related, similarity relatedness of words, which is done by uh, average embeddings. Uh, and it's not done by bag of hangram features. Both of them had issues that we will uh, come into uh, now, uh, but I wanna stop here and see whether this is clear. All right. Um, so two things that we were unhappy about with both of the feature representations we have seen is that first of all, they are static, okay? If you are not still familiar with me saying static versus contextualized, now is the time to change that. Static means that regardless of the sense of a word, if that's a word that has multiple sentences, meaning multiple meanings, we will always represent it with the exact same embedding instead of having different embedding depending on its different senses. So I keep bringing this example of a basing where we have three different senses of the this word basing, but we are always representing it with the same static word to work or glove embedding which is not great because then we are not capturing that particular sense of that word. And then later we have, with, uh, which we'll come to, Transformer gave us contextualized representations, which was uh, very nice because uh, now this is, this is fixed. Um, one thing that maybe like, I didn't, didn't, I think retrospectively I didn't do well is to emphasize because I kind of, and I feel like that's the wrong way of 
uh, teaching RNMs, I kind of try just want to get them out of the way because I want to get to the transformer. But it's a nice actually building block to the transformer. So if I was to teach this again, which I will, um, I would actually spend a little bit more time on the RNMs. And what I would also emphasize is that RNMs also are going to give you hidden representations for these words basin uh, that are different in these three uh, sentences. What I mean by that is RNN goes one token at a time and builds these hidden representations, right? So I will go to the next slide here. Uh, remember these, these uh, equations over here where we have taken the embedding of the current token and we have combined it with the hidden representation of everything that came before. Given the fact that we are using the representation of everything that came before, in these three sentences, what came before is quite different, right? The Amazon, she filled the, the neurosurgeon examined the cranial. They are different and therefore the at that time point, when we come to word basin, we would get different hidden representation of basin. Um, there is a still issue if these sentences become in an exactly same way and then later everything is changed. However, people have, and this is just a side note, you don't need to really remember this if you don't want to, but people have also used bidirectional RNNs where instead of starting from the beginning, you start encoding from the end and go to the left. And then you combine the representation that you get from going from the left and the right. And this is called bidirectional RNN. So already in that space, we have um, been able to capture representations of the words based in here uh, that differ in these different sentences. Okay, um, so emphasizing that because I didn't uh, said it before, um, I don't wanna go over every single detail in an RNM because then I guess we won't have time for anything else. Uh, you have the recording, you have all the information. If you forgot what this is and you need to understand these equations, Go back to the recording and watch it again. Yes, please. Uh huh. Embeddings of the latent space. Okay, let me put it in simpler terms. Yes, both with RNNs and transformer, you will start with a static embedding, which will then be um, um, by doing upcoming computations turned into new representations where this uh, token basing will have different um, different representations in these three uh, sentences. So you're right that we always start with static embeddings regardless where we start. Um, with the uh, deep averaging network, you never get the chance to recover basically, right? Because everything is averaged and you started with this um, same same uh, word basin in each one of these. And yes, sure, the surrounding word embeddings are different, uh, but in the end, you do not have the capacity to get retrieve the token representation specific to, let's say, word is here, that's contextualized, right? Once you scramble everything together and do the, you know, nonlinear transformation, there is no way to get the token specific contextualized representation, unlike with RNNs and the transformer. But you are right that we always start with static stuff and only in later computations, these things become contextualized. Yeah. Okay, so we have introduced RNN, um, then we have extended it with attention, and um, we were still unhappy with one thing, and that's um, um, long-range dependencies. Although we also, with RNNs, unlike with the uh, deep averaging network, we have captured token order because we were building the representations of each token with RNN sequentially, iteratively. So we have captured the word ordered with RNNs, 
However, uh, one thing that in theory RNNs could do, but they, in practice they do not do, is um, model the long-range dependencies well. Meaning if you have a very long text, such as maybe a contract or even a book, you won't be able to remember by the end of the book what happened at the beginning of the book. And this is also not, a book modeling is a really hard challenge even for transformers, but maybe on a level of a single contract or few pages, RNNs don't do this well when transformer do it well. And what enables transformer to do this well is uh, the self-attention mechanism, which we'll uh, repeat again. Another thing that's better with transformers relative to the RNNs, yes, both of them are modeling the order of the words, but in a very different ways. RNNs require that you sequentially process everything right, one token at a time, where uh, the transformer does not need to do that. Uh, it is using these positional embeddings to signal in the representation of a token at which position that token had appeared. But later computations do not need to happen sequentially. You don't need to wait that you have processed previous token to process the next one. Unlike with the uh, RNNs, which is the reason why you can uh, train transformer way faster. And when you can train something way faster, you can scale it. And scale has been one of these important ingredients in uh, producing LLMs. Okay, uh, remember transformer, that scary thing, not scary anymore. Hopefully, um, in any case, your upcoming assignment will require you to implement it. So maybe a few weeks um, after you have implemented, everything will land. Uh, but hopefully, at least it's uh, slightly more familiar than the first time I have shown you this figure. We won't go over every single thing I have mentioned for Transformer. Remember, that was an hour, 20 minute lecture. But I will go over a few components that are maybe new relative to uh, other neural uh, networks. Okay, so first thing was self-attention where we had uh, this uh, procedure where the goal was to produce this attention matrix A of the size uh, max sequence length by max sequence length, which is denoted by N over here. And in this matrix, we had numbers between zero and one in each row, each row sum was uh, one, where for every token, we had captured the importance of other tokens for that given token, okay? And then we use these importances for every token to update every token's representation by taking a little bit from those, a little bit, I shouldn't say a little bit, taking exactly how much attention had said other tokens are important, taking from those tokens their own representations and combining them, folding them into a new representation of a given token. Uh, this is something I have worked out on, uh, you know, iPad, and we have done this metric multiplications to kind of see how this weighted sum of the representations of other tokens uh, is done to produce the representation of a given token. So if this is very unfamiliar. Go back and uh, rewatch uh, that uh, that uh, lecture. But this was the one of the most important bits that we have introduced with the transformer. Then we have also had masked or causal attention, where I told you when you are at the decoder step, you could be training a model in an inefficient way by actually decoding the token and then placing it as the input in the next decoder step. A faster alternative is that you ignore what your model is predicting for the next token and you use whatever had actually appeared in text as the next token. So when you are implementing this, you can immediately take your piece of text you are trying to decode, you can tokenize it, embed it, and feed it into a transformer because everything else is tensor computations, right? The issue is that then in your self-attention, you are looking at how much future tokens are important to decode current tokens, which is Silly, we should not be doing that. Our, we should never know what the next tokens are. We are doing this artificially to speed up training. So what we said is in these attention matrices, we should uh, erase everything that's in the upper diagonal to be uh, zeroed out, right? Because those future tokens should not be uh, contributed to any tokens uh, representation. 
And we said there are two ways to do this. Uh, you can first uh, apply softmax to get the attention weights, and then you can mask the zeros in the upper triangle, but then your sum of rows won't be one anymore. And then we said you need to renormalize it. And to avoid doing these uh, extra steps, what we can do instead is set the upper uh, dia diagonal, excuse me, upper triangle in your attention matrix to minus infinity because softmax of minus infinity is going to be zero, right? So you just do that. You mask it with minus infinity and then you apply softmax. Neither, this is not wrong. It's just less efficient than this one. So you should be doing this one ideally, which you will in your third assignment. Um, and then finally, I guess finally, yeah, we had cross attention as well. And remember, this is not much different than your attention, except that self attention in the encoder is dealing only with the source sequence, whereas the cross attention has what we have decoded so far together with the, um, excuse me, uh, whatever had appeared in source sequence. So um, you are just dealing with two. Uh, input tensors rather than one. And therefore your attention is not all uh, square anymore. It's N by M where N is the number of tokens in the source sequence and M is in the number of tokens in the decoding uh, sequence. But the, the idea is basically uh, the same. Okay, so uh, one last thing about transformer uh, is, okay, uh, we had all these different attention stuff. And then finally at our final decoder, layer is the output layer where we are actually predicting the next token. So here linear means that we have transformed every token's representation into a vector of the size of the number uh, of tokens in the vocabulary, which we do, I uh, hopefully you will immediately know by doing the matrix vector computations. And um, after that, we apply softmax. And once we apply softmax, we have for each uh, decoder step, probability distribution over vocabulary. And the simplest way to actually display a word from this distribution, based on this distribution, is to take the highest probable one, right? And we call this greedy decoding. And we said that this can be as many greedy algorithms in computer science be really inefficient. We have then introduced beam search, which uh, instead is recording a certain number of most probable tokens at each decoding step. So for example, if your number of beams is three, you will record top three uh, uh, most probable word in the first uh, decoding step, then, then the next one and next one, and you will get this many, many paths, right? Uh, the nice thing is that now we know that we can multiply these probabilities to get the probability of a sequence. And uh, then we can see which sequence has the highest probability and display that whole uh, sequence. Um, it still had issues, I said, with uh, repetition and also the fact that humans are not decoding like that. Like we are not always picking the most probable words at a given, uh, you know, timestamp when we say a word. And if we want to have chat GPT kind of decoding where text is very natural, then we need to do something different. And we introduce the idea of sampling from this distribution. And then the whole issue was that some, this distribution at given time steps can be either sharp or flat and, and so on. And we were talking about how to best, uh, you know, uh, sample from a distribution. We said, okay, if the if the probability distribution is too sharp, then by sampling we will all almost is our sample is going to behave like almost like greedy decoding. We are very often almost always going to decode a single word, and if we have that situation, we might want to soften the probabilities by having higher t value here that we use to uh, divide uh, the unnormalized logits. Um, in the other word, uh, in a, another scenario where your probability distribution is too sh uh, too too uh, flat, you might want to sharpen the prob uh, the probabilities, and then you might uh, pick a lower t to achieve that. We talked about top k sampling, where you say, well, let me just uh, fix the number of top uh, top words first, and then sample from those. But then we said again with this problem with sharp or flat distributions. In some situations, you might have way many, way more 
um, you, you, you would still over here uh, sample. Oh, excuse me, guys. I don't know why that happened. Uh, come back. Okay. Even the projector had enough of me. Yeah. Okay. Magic. Okay, while while it's powering up, uh, just to, just to finish the thought. So with the top K, depending on the given decoding step, we can again have a sharp or flat distribution in the vocabulary. So again, you could just be sampling from two too often the same word, just because at that de given decoding step, the distribution is too sharp. Oh, I don't know what's happening here. Okay. All right. So, um, so I was talking about top K sampling, and does bring us to top P or nucleus sampling, where idea is to not sample more or less have the dynamic K. Uh, depending on whether distribution is flat or sharp, which you can achieve by actually looking at tokens whose cumulative probability uh, mass exceeds certain uh, values. So here we will end up with actual tokens that have enough mass, rather like uh, with something like here, where there are very, very low likely token that we would um, have opportunity to sample, sample from. And here we would kind of have more K would be larger for this situation where there is actually uh, more probable words, but all with not super high probability. Okay, so sampling super important concept to know and to understand. One of the most one of the important hyperparameters to be setting when you do these kinds of applications later on. Uh, if someone tells you, "Hey, can you do this?" but I really need to have zero randomness in your head, you should click, aha, uh -huh, we need greedy decoding uh, because we can't have uh, randomness. And you will set all the hyperparameters, top K, top P, temperature, such that you achieve that. Just an example of a real life uh, scenario. Okay, and then uh, I will not talk much about this because we have just talked about it, but the last bit we had is about the fact that the, we are dealing with non-covex optimization, and this brought us to pre-training uh, our models and then using these pre-trained models as a starting point to train the models further for whatever application. For example, today we did sentiment uh, classification. Remember that we had two options. One should be super natural to you because we have talked about language modeling and conditional uh, language modeling a lot. And basically with pre-training, we just do that. Language modeling at, at the test time, we also do some uh, language modeling. 
Uh, the second option was something new where we pre-trained with mask language modeling. And there the situation is slightly different. We had to replace our output layer for decoding the mask tokens with a new output layer, randomly initialized one, which the number of classes is the number of classes you have for your problem. And when we were fine tuning the model, we were changing all the weights of the transformer, including that uh, new uh, layer. Okay, uh, one bit that is important for all of this is tokenization. A lot of our tokenization was just word level tokenization, so splitting the sequence into words. Um, I have introduced software tokenization. Now I feel I introduced it at a bad point because maybe it didn't, um, it's uh, only with Transformer, only post-2016, it was the go-to uh, tokenization scheme. So word embeddings, for example, we subword tokenization wasn't a thing back then. So I was sticking still with the word tokenization when I talked about word embeddings and feed-forward neural networks using a word embedding. So maybe it felt like, like okay, where where is our subword tokenization comes into play? So just to kind of... Um, Make that point clear, all pre-trained transformer models are going to be using uh, subword tokenization. So now that we know about transformer being way better architecture, having all those benefits, and knowing that pre-training has uh, benefits for the optimization and generalization, uh, and the fact that all pre-trained language uh, models are transformer models, you should now remember that then subword tokenization is almost like a part of that whole uh, you know, modeling uh, approach. Um, yeah, we have, when I, when we covered one of these uh, BP examples, we talked uh, again a lot about BPE, um, which is the algorithm to learn tokens that will be placed in the vocabulary and learn rules for splitting a sequence into a list of tokens. And it was data driven. We started by, with an corpus and then we had an algorithm which uh, using some merging rules had decided these are the tokens and um, uh, and excuse me, these are the rules that you can later use to tokenize a sequence into a set of tokens. Um, we know that we are setting the number of merging uh, rules um, that the algorithm will do, which then defines what the vocabulary size is gonna be. So the model, the algorithm doesn't learn the uh, vocabulary size. Uh, it is always going to be the number of merges plus the number of characters. Yes. I don't know, Greg. The exact question is referring to BPE. There's, you don't select a thing that says that if you know the size of the most vocabulary based on the corpus. I assume it has to do with the fact that you are choosing to take Oh, no. Sorry. I made a mess here. Okay. This is why you don't drink coffee. I have a. I will hear, so I will fix this in a second. But hold on to that thought. All right. Ooh. I guess this towel is here for these purposes. <laughs> Not sorry to people whose towel this is. I think this is good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, it was more dramatic than it actually is. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? So, in regards to the BPE exam question, the mm -hmm. reason it's called for you know the size of the vocabulary based on the corpus is because you choose the size of the vocabulary based on what you said. Yeah, exactly. So, the final vocabulary size is going to be K, the number of merges, plus initial set of characters. Yeah, that's going to be the vocabulary size. So it's not learning that from data on its own. It's something we set. It's a hyperparameter that's actually a little bit finicky to set. And there's, again, an open area of research what the good K is. And as we have seen with the, the Berta and Berta example, it can be quite different between different models, right? In one case, we had three over three to four times more tokens in a vocabulary than um, in a other case. I also want you to remember that your output layer when you're doing next token prediction uh, includes a linear transformation into number of tokens in the vocabulary, which means that we need a matrix of the size number of tokens in vocabulary times dimensionality, uh, excuse me, dimensionality of your token embeddings 
times the number of tokens in the vocabulary. So if you have too many tokens in the vocabulary, this weight matrix becomes massive again, which is connecting back to the need for GPUs, GPU memory, it, it becomes a problem. We don't actually want to have huge uh, number of tokens in the vocabulary. And I think sticking with something like 30,000 is more common than having over 100,000 tokens. Okay, so let's maybe wrap. First, I wanna stop, uh, stop. Are there any questions about any of the concepts we have mentioned so far? I will be upset if there are lots of you stay after, but you didn't ask any questions now. Yeah. Let's see, uh, I forgot the names of the point. I know that point of vendors and probably with uh, the uh, problem with uh, not having fun in the rest of the world. Uh, but the one thing um, so I don't know what exactly are you referring to, but the another advancement we had at the top of word to vec was so-called contextualized word representations, where again, uh, static means that uh, word to vec and glove will always have a single uh, representation for your word or a token, regardless of the context they appear in, and regardless of whether this word has different senses, like word bank, for example. Um, with uh, transformer models, we have introduced this idea of contextualized representation, meaning that in our encoder, uh, the final layer is going to give us representation of each token that's highly contextualized, meaning that we are in kind of encoding the information about other tokens in a sequence for a representation of a given sequence. So now if a word has a different sense in these two different sentences, the final representation won't be exactly the same. That's yeah, so it's an transformer, but as I said a little bit before, even with RNNs, you can get a different um, hidden representation um, of words that appear in the same word appearing in different contexts. Um, mm -hmm. But with transformer, this self attention gives it in a very <laughs> more explicit way, I would say, because self-attention metrics kind of encodes importances, right? With just building up hidden representation with RNNs, you don't understand exactly how and why other tokens are important for the hidden representation of a given token. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for each of these, mm -hmm. eliminating the amount of mm -hmm. if you have a chance to or something, Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, remember that we start with a massive corpus of text, something that's really, really, really large. Um, for example, uh, maybe all the news articles in Google News, which you can imagine are very many. Um, and then the first step is to find all the characters that appear uh, in that collection of, of documents that you have. That's going to be your first set of tokens, all the characters. And you're right, if you had never have seen a character in an alphabet of another language, that character won't be part of um, part of the uh, vocabulary, right? And then when we do the character fallout, we don't have the opportunity to break it down uh, to, you know, in these characters. But this is a, in a way, like I would tell, back to you, like, what's your business with like to using a tokenizer for English for a language that has nothing to do with that, you know, like which has completely different alphabet, right? So maybe there is a hidden assumption here that yes, we are using a tokenizer that's data driven and we have certain data, but I don't plan to apply these tokenizers for languages which were not included in my tokenizer. Um, so you can start with a multilingual collection of text, and then, and this is what people do today, these characters in different alphabets are going to be part of your initial set of tokens, and when you do character fallback, they will be broken down uh, in these, um, you know, in the 
you know, like a sequence of subwords, and there if there aren't any subwords longer than one, it's gonna be just pure characters. Um, yeah, so that was a question where, and the answer is, as we said, it's no. Um, maybe want to give a guess, like, like explain back to all of us, like, what, why not? Where, where here are embeddings mentioned? I mean, embeddings. Mm -hmm. it gives embeddings it's a, it gives yeah, so the question is about BP. Let's maybe read it out loud. Okay, so the question is, uh, it uses, BP algorithm uses fixed size embedding for all tokens. Again, where are the embeddings here? Nowhere. Like tokenizer has nothing to do with embeddings, right? Later on, we have our tokens, which our BP algorithm had discovered. And later, we will produce embeddings for those tokens. But the BP algorithm is a algorithm to create the vocabulary and rules to tokenize sequences into tokens. Nothing more, right? Like we should not be, my, my goal with that you know, question, which might be seen as a trick question, is to make sure that you are not um, kind of, I don't know how to express myself, but like since you have learned all of this in a given period of time, some concept might seem like they're highly related. Like we are now using BPs to create embeddings. No, we don't, right? We need to remember what the algorithm is doing exactly. That's that's my goal there, yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, can you repeat and a little bit louder? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a slight correction. Uh, word to vec actually doesn't use BPE. Word to vec was created before BPE was introduced. Um, and we can also think about creating word embeddings on a slighter, more abstract way than just uh, operationalize it in, in the word to vec algorithm. That's just one algorithm for creating uh, embeddings. So you are right. To create word embeddings, you need uh, you need first a corpus where you will get those pairs of words that had appeared together and words that not appear together in a given window size. This is why you need a corpus. And you're right. You need to have a, a notion of vocabulary uh, because later, remember what we are doing with these word embeddings. We are again going to split, uh, use the same uh, tokenization scheme as we have for our word embeddings. And the reason is that uh, if we do not do that, if we have a completely different tokenization scheme, uh, let's say we have learned word embeddings by splitting sequences into words and then representing each word with embedding, but later we use subword tokenization uh, where for some reason we don't have many full words, rather a lot of you know sub subwords. Then you, for many, many, many of them, you won't have an embedding, right? And then everything kind of falls apart. So these two things are connected because given that you're gonna be using the embeddings later on, you want to have embeddings for the tokens you are splitting a given sequence uh, into later on. This is why the, the tokenization needs to be uh, the same. Um, yeah, so again, word to work was applied using word to find word embeddings. And then subword tokenization, like if you go chronologically of like how things happen, then subword tokenization was introduced. And then people have find a way to kind of tweak the word to back with subwords information, which we didn't talk about in this course, because what matters is that later is the transformer has been introduced that uses subwords uh, and creates its own token embeddings, ignoring ignores completely word to vec. So it's it's the best way to kind of handle text these days. So we don't need to really know. Maybe in some specialized situation, you would like to know when word to vec with subword tokenization. You you will do it, but for now, sticking with subword token uh, transformers and pre-trained transformer is the way to go. 
Okay, we are out of time. Yeah, just uh, when you are kind of going over everything, also think about which tasks we have introduced, which kind of approaches we have introduced for them, and what is the evaluation. For me, evaluation of each task is really important. I don't want you to be saying that we are going to use uh, F1 score to evaluate translation or language modeling. So uh, remember how we evaluate three tasks we have introduced, classification, language modeling, and translation. Okay, I'll be around if you have 